Hey everyone, this lesson is on acute interstitial nephritis. So we're going to talk about what causes this condition. We're also going to talk about some of the pathophysiology behind why this occurs. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So what is acute interstitial nephritis or AIN? It is a renal condition involving rapid decline in renal functioning. So it is a condition or a disease involving the kidneys. And it actually accounts for approximately 10 to 20% of all acute kidney injuries or AKIs. And what we will see later on in this lesson is that it is often non-oliguric AKI, which means that urine volume is normal or it is preserved. Whereas in other types of AKIs, we may see a decrease in urine volume. So AIN can be induced by a variety of causes. Medications are going to be by far the most common causes of this condition. Approximately two-thirds of cases of AIN are due to medications. We're going to talk about all these causes in more detail in the next slide, but I want to give a brief overview of some of the categories of causes here. The next category of causes is infections, which is about 10 to 15 percent of cases of AIN. Systemic conditions accounts for 10 to 15 percent of cases. And idiopathic, which means that we don't know what causes it, this accounts for about 5 to 10% of cases. So again, it is a renal condition, so it is a condition involving the kidneys. It accounts for 10 to 20% of AKIs, and it has a variety of causes, medications being the most common category of causes. And we also see infections and systemic conditions being causes as well, and some cases of AIN, we just don't know what causes it that is idiopathic. So what are some of the causes? Let's delve deeper into those categories. So the first one is medications or drugs. And we term this as hypersensitivity. So there's a hypersensitivity reaction to the medications that are taken. And again, as I mentioned before, drugs or medications are the most common cause of AIN. So these include antibiotics. And the antibiotics that can cause AIN include beta-lactams, quinolones, fluoroquinolones, cephalosporins, sulfa drugs, so sulfonamides, and rifampin. And there's some other drugs as well, including non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, so you can think of ibuprofen, proton pump inhibitors, PPI, so you can think of pantoprazole, cimetidine, furosemide, so Lasix, so that's a diuretic. Thiazide diuretics can also cause AIN. We can see triamterine, acyclovir, so an antiviral can also cause this, allopurinol, so allopurinol is for gout, and this can lead to AIN as well, and we can also see the anti-epileptic medication phenytoin causing this condition. So that is the first category of causes. Now, the second category we're going to talk about here is infections. So remember, infections account for about 10 to 15 percent of AIN cases. So Certain bacterial infections can cause AIN, and these include E. coli infections, Campylobacter infections, Seminella, Streptococci infections, Treponema pallidum, so the spirochete that is responsible for syphilis can also lead to AIN as well. Certain viral infections can cause acute interstitial nephritis, so measles, mumps, herpes simplex virus infections, HIV cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus infections can all cause this condition. And then we can also see fungal infections like coccidiomycosis and histoplasmosis being potential causes of acute interstitial nephritis. And then we can also see protozoal infections like toxoplasmosis being a potential cause. And then we mentioned that 10 to 15 percent of cases are due to some underlying systemic condition. So there are some immune and systemic disorders that can cause AIN, and these include lupus, so systemic lupus erythematosus, Sjogren's syndrome, and sarcoidosis. And then, like we mentioned before, there are idiopathic cases, so cases where the cause is not entirely understood or the etiology is not discovered. And in some cases, the idiopathic causes may be related to some related conditions, including antitubular basement membrane disease and TINU syndrome, T-I-N-U syndrome. So again, causes include hypersensitivity to medications and drugs like antibiotics and some other medications like NSAIDs and PPIs and some other medications like diuretics. 
infections can lead to AIN, and these include a wide variety, including bacterial, viral, fungal, and protozoal infections. Certain immune and systemic disorders can lead to this condition as well, including lupus, Sjogren's, and sarcoidosis. And then there's some idiopathic cases as well. So now that we know those causes of AIN, what is the pathophysiology behind the condition? So here is a nephron. So here's the glomerulus, and here's the descending tubule, ascending tubule, and then we have the collecting ducts here. So for the most part, most cases are going to be related to some medication use. So drug-induced AIN, or drug-induced acute interstitial nephritis, the pathophysiology behind it is due to the drug or the medication itself. So in this instance, drugs or medications act as haptins, and they bind to tubular cell components during secretion. So when the medications are being secreted from the nephron, so they're being excreted through the urine, they can lead to an immune response. So they again act as haptins. They bind to certain tubular cell components, and this leads to an immune response. So there's a immune attack on tubular cells. So this is one mechanism as to how acute interstitial nephritis develops. And with regards to drug-induced or medication-induced acute interstitial nephritis, there's a certain latent period, which may be upwards of several weeks to months. And with regards to infection-induced acute interstitial nephritis, this may be due to microbial antigens, so certain proteins from the microbes themselves, certain bacterial components or viral components that get deposited into the interstitium. So the interstitium is the area surrounding these components of the nephron. And this leads to an immune response. So those antigens become deposited in the area surrounding the nephron. And then there's an immune response. There's an immune attack on those areas surrounding the nephron. And this can lead to damage. So this can lead to acute interstitial nephritis. And then there may be some microbial effects directly that may also mediate the damage. So some parts of the microbe could actually damage parts of the nephron as well, leading to this condition. So for the most part, these are going to be some of the main mechanisms and some of the other mechanisms by which systemic conditions influence or cause AIN is not very well understood. So what are some of the clinical features of AIN? So for the most part, this may be an asymptomatic condition. So no symptoms at all. And as we mentioned before, it could be a non-oliguric AKI, so no change in urine volume, no decrease in urine volume, but it could be an oliguric AKI, so there could be some decreased urine output. We may also see nausea and vomiting in this condition, malaise, so a general feeling of unwellness. There could be some flank pain, so pain along the sides. So those, for the most part, are the symptoms someone's going to experience if they have this condition. And again, most of the time, it may be asymptomatic. And there are certain laboratory findings which are important to recognize in this condition. And these include sterile pyuria. So when there's a urinalysis that is performed, there is pyuria, which means there's pus in the urine. So there's white blood cells in the urine, and it's sterile. So there's no bacteria found in the urine itself, but there are white blood cells. There's pus in the urine. We can also see white blood cell casts. So this is a key term we're going to see with acute interstitial nephritis, white blood cell casts. And then we can also see some proteinuria, so some urinary excretion of protein. But again, it is not the type of proteinuria we're going to see in other conditions like nephrotic syndrome. So it's a subnephrotic range, just a small amount of proteinuria. And there can also be some microscopic hematuria, so some blood that's also mixed in with the urine that is not visible to the naked eye. And there may be some peripheral eosinophilia, so when an individual's blood work is checked, they may have high levels of eosinophils. So again, AIN may be asymptomatic, can be non-oliguric, oftentimes it is non-oliguric AKI, but can be oliguric in some cases. Nausea and vomiting may occur, malaise may occur, and flank pain may occur. And there are some key laboratory findings that we're going to see in this condition, including sterile pyuria, 
white blood cell casts, and subnephrotic proteinuria. And we may also see some microscopic hematuria and peripheral eosinophilia. Now, there's some other specific clinical features depending on the underlying cause of the condition. If it is drug-induced acute interstitial nephritis, there can be a skin rash and possibly a low-grade fever. And we may also see eosinophilia being more common in drug-induced AIN. So this is what we term the classic triad of drug-induced acute interstitial nephritis, skin rash, low-grade fever, and eosinophilia. Although a lot of times we're not going to see all three of them occurring at the same time. And in fact, only 10% of drug-induced acute interstitial nephritis cases are going to have all three of these classic triad signs and symptoms. Now in infection-associated acute interstitial nephritis, we can see fever, so a fever that is being generated by the infection itself. And a lot of times the signs and symptoms or the clinical features are going to be more specific to particular underlying illnesses and infections. So if it's caused by treponema pallidum infection, we're going to see signs and symptoms of syphilis. If it's a condition involving an infection with salmonella, we're going to see gastrointestinal symptoms. So it depends on the underlying illness or infection. And then in cases where we see systemic illness associated acute interstitial nephritis, signs and symptoms are going to be related to the underlying systemic condition. So for instance, if Sjogren's syndrome is the underlying systemic condition, we're going to see issues with dry eyes and dry mouth. So again, it depends on the systemic illness that is leading to or is associated with this condition. So now that we know all of the signs and symptoms, how is it diagnosed and treated? So diagnosis of AIN involves a urinalysis, as we mentioned before. So again, we look for steropyuria, we look for white blood cell casts, very key, and we also can see some proteinuria as well. Some blood work can also be helpful, especially if we see peripheral eosinophilia. But kidney biopsy is actually required for a definitive diagnosis, although this is not often undertaken. A lot of times it's going to be diagnosed clinically. So with urinalysis and blood work, it's not going to go to kidney biopsy, although in some cases, kidney biopsy can be performed. And this is actually the only way to give a definitive diagnosis for acute interstitial nephritis. So once a clinician has diagnosed acute interstitial nephritis, how is it treated? A lot of times it's important to identify and remove the offending agent. So if it's a medication that is causing acute interstitial nephritis, stop the medication. If it's an infection, treat the infection. If it's a systemic condition, treat that systemic condition. So it's all about removing the offending agent. Corticosteroids are also very important, especially early on in the condition. So in early stages of acute interstitial nephritis, giving corticosteroids seems to be very important. So early initiation, very key to reducing the morbidity of this condition. And we may see recovery occurring within two weeks. And then in some cases where acute interstitial nephritis causes a lot of damage, a lot of kidney damage, if it's not treated or not recognized, it can lead to severe kidney damage where dialysis is required. So again, diagnosis of AIN, oftentimes it's through urinalysis and blood work. We see those white blood cell casts. We see steropyuria. So most of the time, that's going to be the way this is diagnosed. Although for a definitive diagnosis of this condition, we need a kidney biopsy, although this is not often performed. And then treatment, again, involves removing the offending agent. So identify and remove the possible cause of this condition. Corticosteroids especially early initiation, we can see recovery within two weeks, and then dialysis may be required if there is severe kidney damage. So if you want to learn more about other nephrology conditions, please check out my nephrology playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel so stay up to date on future lessons. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.